I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of time. Time seems to move so slow, so we're left confused when we realize how much time has actually passed. The strangest feeling is going to sleep and waking up like no time has passed at all. Could have been 8 hours, 15 minutes, it all feels the same. Don't forget that, because today I want to convince you that you actually can go back to the past. And this isn't a play on words, purely physics. You might appreciate this video, or you might call it deranged. There's a reason why everybody romanticizes the past and it's deep-rooted in our psychology. Today, I want to share this with you and how you could use it to not only manipulate others, but to manipulate your own mind to live a happier life. This part of our psychology is so strong that it influences almost all of our preferences. One of the most common patterns in the music or film industry is fans always preferring the old over the new. Whether it's a new album, sequel to a film, or even a second iteration of a game, the pattern is predictable in the majority of cases. Better graphics, better plots, better acting, better quality isn't enough because of what we associate the prior iteration with. The past. Where we were, who we were with, playing those games, how young we were. In some cases, new iterations can be preferred, but every aspect needs to not just be better, but exponentially better than the prior. The new iteration isn't just competing with the old, it's competing with the old combined with everything you associated with your experience with the old. But why is the old and the past always associated with better? It's very simple. We want what we can't have. And the past is something we believe is impossible to get back. Everything we know about the world tells us that it's not possible to go back and re-experience the past. And that's why we romanticize it so much. We can't have it. When a relative, friend, or pet of yours passes away, they're gone for good. There's no getting them back into our lives. And it's then more than ever that we appreciate and love them more than any time during their life, which is such a tragic thing. While you still can, try to spend some quality time with your parents or your friends and remind them of how much you love them, because you'll give everything just for one more chance to, but only once they're gone, and that's if you still have a chance, because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. You're not a bad person for taking people's existence for granted. This is simply human nature. We're all like this. It's we're all like this. It's not until you know for sure that somebody's gone that you'd pay every last dollar just to see them one more time. And at the same time, we forget all the negative things we associated with them now that they're gone. You don't tend to remember all the times your pet ruined your furniture. You don't remember all the times someone mistreated or betrayed you. You don't remember the lack of freedom and authority you had when you were a child. You only remember the good. And going out of your way to try to remember the bad is not a good solution to cope with something that's gone. There's another solution. And you might think it's insane, but lots of well-known people use this tactic in various other ways to improve their quality of life. You essentially need to hack your own mind. You see, not everything in this world is absolutely definitive. There's some things that we really don't know for sure. These are all opportunities to manipulate your own mind into believing whatever is going to optimize your quality of life. This is a practice many physicists and philosophers have used in their own life. Einstein once said, I believe in Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns himself with fates and actions of human beings. He also did not believe in an afterlife, stating, One life is enough for me. Whether you like the guy or not, Andrew Tate actually summed this practice up very well when discussing... No, I accept that paradigm. 
I don't believe in it. I believe that I can fix this myself. I believe if I change my reality and create an experience of life that I am absolutely not only satisfied by, I will no longer feel. You will cure most of your own problems. Take two men, put them in two individual haunted houses. Haunted houses. One believes in ghosts, one doesn't. There's a loud noise in the night. The one who believes in ghosts wakes up and is paranoid, is afraid, can't sleep, is sitting in the corner of the room shaking. The one who doesn't believe in ghosts goes back to sleep. It is the belief in the ghost which punishes him, not the ghost itself. If you do not believe in the you can never be That's why I don't believe in it. And to go into a broader point about all of that, I don't even give a shit if I'm wrong. Because I've adopted a mental model that makes me ultimately and utterly competitive in all realms of human endeavor. And if by me not believing in depression, I am better at fighting the idea of being, if I am better at making myself feel happier, if I am better at regulating my emotions by not believing in an idea, then I'll continue to stay wrong. I do not believe in things that take power away from me. I believe in things that make me more powerful. The key takeaway is his acknowledgement of the fact that he might be wrong. He's not arguing about science. He's simply choosing to believe in what will make him most competitive in life. And in the same way, if you were to hack your mind and convince yourself that you really could go back in the past, relive those childhood memories, say I love you to your mother and father again, and you truly believed it, then suddenly you'd be free. But how in the world can any sane, rational, and fairly intelligent individual convince themselves of such an irrational thought? Introducing the art of synthesizing theories. There's lots of completely reasonable theories in physics, while not fully proven, are certainly very realistic and believable. However, if you synthesize multiple of these theories together, you can come to some pretty bizarre conclusions. When you combine determinism with heat death and quantum fluctuations, you come to a ridiculous conclusion. Following heat death, once the universe has reached a maximum state of entropy, all that is left is quantum fluctuations. And with infinite time, by law, all possibilities will inevitably eventually happen. And one quantum fluctuation that will happen with infinite time is the same Big Bang that started this universe's deterministic cycle billions of years ago. And I hope you didn't forget that whether you're sleeping for 8 hours or 15 minutes, it all seems to feel the same. You won't be conscious during this period. The moment you go to sleep, you're going to wake right back up, relive everything precisely how it was because it's all deterministic. And that includes you watching this video and considering subscribing. This is a lot to take in, I understand, but lucky for you, I already made videos about determinism, heat death, and quantum fluctuations, so you could really convince yourself that you're going to live this same exact life all over again, precisely the same. And that includes reliving your childhood, seeing your parents, playing with your dog, and even considering sharing this video with your best friend. And remember, it doesn't matter if we're wrong. What matters is that we're believing in something that is improving the quality of our life. And no, I actually don't think I'm insane. How many people do you know that believe in an afterlife where they're gonna see their friends and family? I don't think those people are insane. I just think that they know how to live a good life. starts the real question is is it going to be you or just a copy of your consciousness